Our text for this morning is from our epistle reading from Philippians 2. Paul says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is our text. Dear friends, sisters, and brothers, last week uh, we had the, uh, we talked about the parable of the, the workers in, in the vineyard, right? And, uh, and what, what, was the, what was the complaint of the, uh, of the workers? Do you remember? It's not fair. It's not fair, right? It's, it's not fair. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that this week. Uh, Paul addresses that. We have, we have a tendency to, uh, to brood over the, the injustices of this life, especially the injustices that have been done you know, to me, right? And um, that's part and parcel of, of I think, the uh, human tendency towards, towards self-interest with which all of us have been born, that, that deep and intractable inclination to put me and my needs and my interests at the center of life. Right. Um, that's just human nature. But it can be a problem, right? Um, as Tiny found out. Because self-interest has a tendency to, to, and left unchecked, it will alienate us from one another and alienate us from God. And it works like this, right? If, if my interests come first in life, that necessarily puts me in competition with you and everybody else here, right? Because what's in your interest and what's in my interest may not be the same thing, Right? We've seen that played out on large scale down on Capitol Hill this week, right? And so, right, then life becomes a, a dance of trying to get you to do what I want while simultaneously trying to guard myself from what you want. And it's from that source uh, that, that power games and manipulations and insecurities and resentments creep into and mar our relationships. And it's ironic, of course, right? Because we, we, long, for, we long for true friendship and intimate relationships. And yet so often... So often our behaviors and attitudes are completely at odds with that goal, right? We, we self-sabotage our relationships. It happens, uh, it happens in marriages and families. If you doubt that, have you ever read like, a, I don't know, like a Post or Times article about marriage and then go and like read the comments? It's, it's very enlightening. Um... But it happens in marriages and families. It happens among friends and colleagues. It happens in churches. In fact, the issue, one of the issues that Paul discusses uh, in this letter is a dispute between two of the, the leading women in that congregation. And Paul says, <laughs> knock it off. Right? right, but that happens, right? People who... People who may equally love Jesus, but, but maybe have a different set of priorities or, or just rub each other the wrong way, right, can cause a lot of havoc in a congregation. And if self-interest harms our relationships to one another, what does it do to our relationship to God? Right, because God is really the ultimate threat to my self-interest. Because if God is God, it means that I may not get my way. Right? I may not get my way. And so again, unchecked, self-interest cuts me off from God and isolates us 
from one another, right? Because the idol of myself is a jealous God. And so the Apostle Paul reminds us today that Jesus shows us another way. Jesus shows us another way. Do you guys remember the, uh, this was back in the 90s, right? The, the WWJD bracelets that people had. I saw, I, speaking of the 90s, I saw somebody post on Facebook like a picture of like their, their youth Bible that they had. And it had, you know, I don't know, like skateboarders on it and all kinds of, you know. And, and they said, you know, Bibles of the 90s were, were 50% more extreme than Bibles from other decades. But, but of course, another, another aspect of that, you're right, another bit of Christian pop culture from that decade, right, was the WWJD bracelet, which stood for what? good, right? What would Jesus do? This is a good question. It's a good question. A friend of mine recently said, I I like this, he he said, right, with with regards to our relationship to God, Jesus is our Savior. In regards to our relationship to one another, Jesus is our example. And so so Paul answers this question, uh, what would Jesus do, by asking another question, what has Jesus done? Right? What has Jesus already done? So if you want to know what Jesus would do, you look at what he, what he actually did. For Paul, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus become the pattern for, for how to live because, God, because Jesus is, is the flesh and blood image of the love of God. And so Paul says to them, he says, have this mind among yourselves. Right? Think, think this way. Have this mind among yourselves, which is already yours in Christ Jesus. I love that, right? This is already who you are, so be who you are. That's what he's, he's saying. He's, he's telling them, he's, he's telling them to, to live, to live by, by imitation what they already are by imputation. Be who you are, he says. Because Jesus, who was, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality a th- with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, right? He, he emptied himself. The one who shared in the very essence of God chose not to, to clutch onto his equality with God, but let it go. Jesus lets go of all the honor and, and the glory and the privilege that by all rights belong to him in order to become a human being in order to, to live essentially as a homeless man, in order to die the death of a slave. And he does all of that to rescue the people who killed him. That's what Jesus did. The New Testament scholar uh, Tom Wright points out, that, uh, rem- points out that Paul lived in a society. He's writing in a society that was ruled by a series of, of human emperors who had declared themselves to be gods and then crucified everybody who opposed them. And by contrast, Jesus is the true God who made himself a human being and who died on the cross for the sake of his enemies. It's a message completely at odds with the world that Paul lived in. It's it's a message completely at odds with the world that we live in. It's no wonder that during Jesus' trial that that the Roman governor Pontius Pilate seems seems baffled by the notion that that Jesus might be a king. Right? The servant of Caesar can't imagine that the king of the universe would establish his reign not through not through power and in might, but by weakness. Not by vengeance, but through forgiveness. Jesus turns everything upside down, including the way that we regard ourselves in one another. And so Paul says, right, do... Do nothing from rivalry and conceit, but in humility count others more significant 
than yourselves. Count others more significant than yourselves. This is very different from, I don't know, the, the sort of, um, a lot of the advice that you, that you see out there on social media these days, which is much more, put yourself first and cut the toxic people out of your lives, right? But Paul says, count others more significant than yourself. The cross of Christ ought to leave us in awe of one another. I want you to look around. I want you to look at the people next to you. Take a moment, right? It's easy to, to, you know, you see them every day. It's easy to take them for granted. The cross of Jesus should leave you in absolute awe of one another because the cross of Jesus means that everyone in this room, in fact, everyone you're going to meet today, is someone that the Son of God considered worth dying for. And so are you. The Son of God went to the cross with your interest at heart. Which means that you are free to let go of self-interest. The creator of the universe became a servant for you, which now means that you are free to be servants to one another. You no longer have to worry about looking out for yourself because the cross is the pledge that the God who created all things and who has all things in his hands has given himself for you and along with himself will also give you everything you need. Everything you need. So trust in him. Trust in him and let go of self-interest. And may you abide in the hope that he brings and share in the mind of Christ until that day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen.